And welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with your host, Daniel. And Daniel. Hey, Daniel, I'm going to go with the stereotypical joke. Oh, God. It's been a while, hasn't it? Oh, dear God. Yeah. You know, so, speaking of bad dad jokes, I was at, I, I recently got a haircut while I was off of my, on a two-week break, and, no, I guess this isn't the joke, but I, I just got back from what I'm going to be talking about here in a bit, um, yesterday. And when I got back, I had to take the day off of work to, to travel. And I thought you were already off yesterday. No. No, yeah. I, I had to request it off because I was off the two prior weeks. Well, I thought uh, Indigenous People Day was a day off. Not at our school. Yeah, no, okay. it's not a, not a common day off anyway. But yeah, so all the students returned because I'm a teacher. And um, I got back. And a lot of the teachers, whenever you get something as simple as a haircut, which I got a couple weeks ago, yeah, and I yeah. forgot about it, they are freaking out. They're like, Mr. McKinley, you got a haircut? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you look so weird. And all this stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, which is pretty normal. But they're like, you got a haircut? And so every, I, I got kind of like, like, yeah, sure did, you should. And then like every five minutes, another kid, you got a haircut? And then, so at first I was going, I did? <laughs> like, like nervously looking at my head, like, what? <laughs> like, nobody told me this, I thought it looked different. Um, and then after that, um, whenever it was, if a staff came up to me, like, hey, you got a haircut. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I liked it so much, I got the rest of them cut too. Oh, dear God. And just, I, knew I just where that kept joke doing, was going, yeah. yeah, I kept doing just bad, bad jokes like that. Just because that, that cracks me up. And so, that's been my day. <laughs> All day doing that same bad joke. Oh, dear God. <laughs> oh, I, and you know, but I've had to hear it so many times today. I'm, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> so Daniel, how are you? Uh, I'm, I, I'm dying on the inside after that. Well, that's good. It's spooky season. You should it, be. It's yeah, it's spooky <laughs> season, but nothing's worse than a bad pun. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you ever watch a Pauly Shore movie? I actually enjoyed a few of them. Biodome is quite hilarious. It is. It really is. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Isn't he like? He, I know he isn't he supposed to be doing like a serious role re- like recently. He wants to do um, a biopic on Richard Simmons, the the old um, exercise guy. Yeah, yeah. Because no, a lot Richard of people Simmons. say, yeah, a lot of people say he looks like Richard Simmons, especially now that he's older. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he might be all right at that. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I, I've never seen him in a serious role. Honestly, I haven't seen him since what. I think the last movie I watched of his was Jury Duty. The last one I watched of his was Pauly Shore is Dead. Yeah, I, I never watched that It one. was actually pretty funny. I will give it credit. It was legitimately kind of funny. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, speaking of people being dead, uh, that... There goes our segment. Yeah, there goes our segment, speaking right? Speaking of dead. Uh, our episode today is we're talking, we're doing a board game brainstorm where we take an old classic game of at least, uh, how many Ten years? years? Ten years. And we break down, based on our normal five criteria, games that we can recommend based on what parts of that game you like. Mm -hmm. So this will be a resource for that. But before we get into that game today, Daniel, what have you been doing outside of gaming? All right, so the one thing I talked about, and I kind of gave you a sneak peek the last time we talked about it. Again, I am a huge sports fan, so there's no problem. Today, today, as of recording, which is the 10th of October is the start of hockey season. And I am super excited about that. I love watching hockey. Um, I fell in love with the sport really 2009, 2010. Um, mm-hmm. I, that's when I started watching a lot of it. Uh, I've been watching it ever since. Most of our game nights, usually around this time, I'll have a hockey game on the TV in the yep, background. That's why you game. sit where you do. <laughs> you do. Yeah, that's why. Just look over our shoulder. Uh, yeah, there's a I like how you're like staring at us and you just... <laughs> to see what's going on in the hockey game. And I, I learned I had to do that sometimes because we had people that had, like, uh, analysis paralysis. Sure. And it's usually the way where I sat, I was the next one in line. So I was just be sitting there like, all right, well, at least there's something entertaining to watch on the screen. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so I really do enjoy hockey. Uh, I watch it uh, almost most of the week especially when it's on i'll put it in the background while i'm like cleaning the house or sure. i'm cooking dinner or something like that just put it in the background when we're pretty much watching the games i'm not a, uh like i got teams that i like to keep an eye on 
but I'm not like a big super fan like I am as a Cubs fan or a, a Titans fan when it comes to the other two sports. I, I do follow like the Blackhawks, the Golden Knights, the Kraken. The Golden Knights and the Kraken being the two newest teams to the league. So I've got to watch them grow from the ground up. And both of them become really good. In fact, the Golden Knights, who are only six years old, I want to say, just won the Stanley Cup last year. Uh, probably one of the fastest uh, non uh, or expansion teams to win a championship outside of like the original uh, expansion in the NHL when they went from 6 to 12. Uh, but yeah, I do enjoy it. It's a fun, fast-paced sport. You don't really get to play it out here because it's so freaking hot, even though we have a hockey team about 40 minutes away, a junior hockey team, the El Paso Rhinos. But I'm like, there's no, I, I, there's a reason it's got to play in October, but it's still 80 degrees outside. It was 88 yep. today. No, 85 today. It, it was quite warm today. I'm like, there's no way we could have ice. Where, But my favorite of the hockey is the outdoor games. I love watching the outdoor games. Every year at New Year's, they'll do what they call the um, uh, Winter Classic, and they'll play a game outside. My favorite one so far was when the Red Wings were hosting at the University of Michigan, and it was a freaking blizzard outside while they were playing hockey. It was just so fun to watch. And I think that was the largest hockey crowd. I think they hit 100,000 people at that game. So it's, in, it's incredible. It's a fun sport to watch if you're just give it a chance and look at it. The physicality on there is bigger than football. The pace is better than soccer. So, uh, hockey. That's not hard to get. Yeah. The pace on it is beyond most games, honestly. Yeah. Like, they, they have a gnarly pace. And they're doing all this with knives on their feet. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised more people don't get cut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's been some bad act, uh, injuries I've seen because of the blades in the last 10 oh, years sure. or something yeah. like that. I saw someone get, like, not the karate, but they did slice them in the neck. At one point, because he got hit while someone was trying to go over him, and there was a slice in the neck. Wow. Yeah, that was brutal. bad. Yeah. And you? What have you been doing outside gaming? So I just re I, I talked about it real quick. Um, I just came back from a convention. Yeah. In fact, uh, two conventions. I talked about one last week. Yep. Um, where I came back from the proto spiel up in Albuquerque, but then um, outside of gaming, I went to another convention where we uh, went to Yuma, mm -hmm. Arizona. I don't know if there's any other Yuma. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, we've talked about it before because we filmed a live episode there right. last year. Yeah, exactly. And you were able to join us last year. Unfortunately, you weren't able to this year. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this was a good time. It was me and my uh, cohort who was co-owner of our business, right? We ran our escape room puzzles. Mm -hmm. And it was a good fun. We did have... Um, two repeats which was the first time that ever happened where we had somebody from last year come in and attempt the puzzle a second time okay uh, a year later um like like some teenage girl and her friend they both did separate groups and they were competing for their time <laughs> and so here was the best part it's a 45 minute puzzle the first group um the girl who was really excited about it her group of her and three other new people Solved it with a minute um, and thir and twenty seven seconds remaining. Or no, I'm sorry, a minute and thirty four seconds remaining. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very to the wire. Their other group came in and beat it with only a hundred twenty seven seconds remaining. So <laughs> seven seconds shorter. However, they only used two hints. So I know they're gonna go argue <laughs> about which one is better. It's like, well, seven seconds longer, sure. But we only use two of our, what, two of our three, three hints, right, yeah. yeah. And so just silly stuff like that. We also had some people attempt our bigger puzzle, which is a ninety-minute puzzle. That's really fun to watch. That one's always fun to watch. That one. Yeah. Oh, it really is. Even the first time I actually saw that puzzle uh, was last year at Yumicon, and watching oh, yeah. people do that puzzle was quite hilarious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And of course, like, like how I always do, I went and talked to all the people at all the booths that we were neighbors with. Yeah. And, really friendly people i met another game designer there uh, there was one uh these these two women who are selling a lot of like custom art and they had some beautiful pictures of like uh tom nook from animal crossing <laughs> kk slider isabel um and and i was like you know what i really need that kk so i went up and i was like i was like i would love to buy a copy of that kk and they looked at me they're like you're the first person so far that specifically came here for Animal Crossing. <laughs> I was like, is it not popular anymore? They're like, apparently not, because nobody asked about it except for you. <laughs> I was like, wow. 
And just a few minutes earlier, I was playing my Animal Crossing. Yeah. So I was like, I got to get on, get in on this. And so that was really satisfying. Um, and I did actually pick up a game from from there. Okay. Uh, Lorcana. Okay, yeah, I saw that. That's I was figuring that's where you got it from because you didn't buy it at the Target because you can't find it in the Target. No, no, you can't find it at Target, but that's, I bought a few other games there, but I got it from that uh, convention. There was a yeah. game store that happened to have some copies of Lorcana there. Nice. And I was like, all right, I'll get one of each of the decks because I've been wanting to do so. Yeah. So we'll have to play it sometime. Yep, but maybe tomorrow. One of the big things is we, w- me and my, my mutual partner, Jim, we, we have a tradition of whenever we go do a... Uh, our escape room puzzles at conventions and stuff. You go do escape rooms. We go do an escape room. Yeah. And we did one again. Same one we did last year? The same room. Or not the same room. The same company. Yeah. A different room. They had four rooms and... and Was it the same four as last time or did they change them out? They It was the same four. They had uh, the Prohibition one, which we did last year. Yeah. And we did the um, Da Vinci which, one. By the way, this is Escape Room Yuma or Yuma, Yuma yeah. Escape Room. It's downtown. Go check them out. They're pretty good quality, and they're actually cheaper than most escape rooms, which is awesome. Yeah, they're they're a really cool company. We did the Da Vinci one and Prohibition last year. Yeah. This year, there was two others. I forget what the fourth one was, but that was the one we were originally going to do, but it was booked up. Mm. Is that the bomb one? No, I, I think they have a different one, actually. Than okay, because the bomb one's like that big one that they require a big group to do. Right. And then we ended up doing one that was called um, The Warehouse. Okay. Which is horror themed. Nice. Yeah. Which I like. My my partner is not super happy. Uh, or not super... Like, Thrilled with horror? Yeah, he's not the biggest. He doesn't like jump scares and stuff like yeah. that. And so... But one of the things that they did, which I really appreciated, they asked right at the beginning, they're like, all right, before we let you in the room, do you, are you guys okay with being blindfolded? <laughs> as you're entering the room. And me and we're all like, yeah, of course. Like, what? Why wouldn't we be, right? You know, And I, I get why some people wouldn't be. Yeah. We're like, yeah, of course, that's fine. They're like, also, do you mind being handcuffed to the wall? And we're like, sure, why not? You know. So we went in there, and, they, and so they blindfolded us. They let us in with our wrists, and then uh, actual, actually like handcuffed, handcuffed us to the wall. And they weren't like the cheap, like, oh, there's a little notch handcuff, and they yeah. come right off. No, they were real handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one set of keys... Um, where uh, Jim, he had access to him, and she jokingly said, like, yeah, you can share him with you, him if you want. And like, ah, that's funny. And she, he found the keys, like, all right, cool. Here you, Danny. Give it to me. He's like, all right, guys. All right, now we can get to work. <laughs> and then we went into it. And as we were driving back, because it's a seven-and-a-half-hour drive home, Yeah. him and I started discussing, like, what if we went in there and did it again, right, but played it off like we didn't? And one of us chose to leave the other one handcuffed. <laughs> Would it be worth the bit for an hour? Like where, where like you'll still be like solving puzzles, but like you yeah. are shackled to that wall the whole time. Or like one of us just put it like just far enough where the other person can't reach. It's like, ah, oh, come on. Like what is that? Like would it be like we would almost make them feel bad for us. Yeah. But if we still solve the puzzle, can you imagine how hilarious that would be? That would be funny. That would be like. I don't know if it'd be worth the bit, but I think it really would be, because we're we're loving every minute of that. There were some puzzles that were a little a little wonky. Um, like if I rated this out of ten, like mm-hmm. ten being the best escape room I've ever done, uh, one being just one of the worst, yeah, abysmal, like just not absolutely not worth my time. Um, this would probably be about a six and a half seven. I mean that's still good. Yeah. Um, I remember when we did the Prohibition, I really liked that one. I, I found mm-hmm. that to be probably a seven. Yeah. Uh, the Da Vinci one was actually better than I was expecting it to be. The that Da Vinci one, one was my favorite yeah. so far. Uh, that was an eight for me. That one was really good. Yeah. Yeah, my only problem with the Da Vinci one is, uh, that it, it didn't, it wasn't linear. Mm. And, and they did preface that, too. Yeah. They said, they're like, hey, look, this isn't a linear escape room. So you can get lost a little bit. So just try and go back on like some of the stuff if you need to. But um, the big problem that I had is when we were doing that one, it seemed like the person was like getting ready to close up and kind of wanted us to hurry along. Yeah. And kind of fed us too many answers. No, no, it wasn't the Vichy. Oh, that, was, that was prohibition. Yeah, yeah, there was one of those where I was like, uh, like that's that's not something you should do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, nothing against them. I think that was just how they how it was that night. Yeah. 
Or maybe we were just that lost and like, man, they really need help. No, the, I think the big part of it, too, is that there was a part that wasn't working properly and we were struggling trying to get it open, so she oh, had to yeah. come in and open it for us. That's so they right. Really, yeah. Yeah, and we did have... How's it going, ABQ Place? We, we did have some other stuff that was similar to that. Like, nothing that was fundamentally broken, mm -hmm. but I will say the, the ultimate goal of what we were trying to do in the warehouse mm -hmm. made no sense. Like, it really didn't. It was okay. like, you need to find XYZ. It was like, okay, cool. And once we found it, we put it in. We're like, it was like, game over. You won. <laughs> we're like, why? Yeah. You know, and that so was how my was biggest that core argument. core theme then? Well, so the theme is that you have been abducted by a serial killer, and he's going to be back within, within one hour to come kill you. And so you're just trying to escape. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. There there was one prop in it, though, that was really, really disgustingly awesome. Nice. And I will tell you that after the show. The yeah. show yeah. Because it was really good. ABQ plays, uh, just real quick. I talked about Yumacon that I was just at, which, by the way, we're hoping to go back again next year. It's mm -hmm. looking like we probably will. Yumacon, go support them. Go yeah. support the Arts Council in Yuma, Arizona. I really appreciated them. They've been great to us, and they... They were awesome for our company. But Proto Spiel Albuquerque, by the way. ABQ Plays, thank you two weeks ago for bringing that. I hope you've recovered since then. Because <laughs> I know he was tired. Yeah. Because I chatted with him until about 1 a.m. one night. <laughs> Poor guy. Everyone else slept and I was there ta chatting with him. So sorry, ABQ. <laughs> Absolutely. Go support that if you can. If you're ever in Albuquerque next year... If it's going on again, which I really hope it is, wink, wink, go support it. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah, let's get into this episode. Mm-hmm. So, board game brainstorm. Let's talk about what this is. We take a classic game, 10 plus years old. This week's theme is Betrayal at House on the, at yeah. House on the Hill. Yeah, Betrayal at the House on the Hill. Betrayal at the House on the Hill. It's such a weird title. Weird. It it's, doesn't roll it doesn't, off the tongue very well. It really long. doesn't, yeah. Um, it get clogs in the throat is what it does. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that game. We have five criteria that we normally break down our games with. Top when eight we're debates. doing our top eight debates, we break it down by ease of play, which is how easy uh, and familiar the rules are. Uh, replay value. Uh, that includes expansions, uh, length of time, the scaling well, uh, and the minimum number of plays for the full experience. A meaningful choice. How well you have to incorporate your tactics, strategy, skills, um, impacting other players or just overall good strategy in the game uh game immersion uh is the game fun to lose the player interactions the table talks the role playing and the memorable moments that make you stand up and shout and art and production how good the pieces are the graphic design the artwork all of that stuff we want to find new games that you, if you like this stuff you'll probably like the other one nice with that being said let's start right at the top of our list remember betrayal house on the hill let's describe what that game is yeah. first this is a fascinating board game that came out, I want to say, in like early 2000s, mm -hmm. like 2004 or something like that. No, no, it was, uh, I think it was like 2013. Or... Yeah. It, no, it's it's longer than that, because that would only be 10 years ago. Yeah, I'll look it up while you're describing it. Yeah, it, it was a while ago. So Betrayal House on the Hill was a game by Avalon Hill, and uh, Bruce Glasgow is the designer. Yeah, 2004 was the original printing. Uh, the second edition came out, I think, in like 2013. And then they're on a third edition. Yep, and they've also made a few other offshoots like Betrayal of Baldur's Gate, Betrayal Legacy. Yep. We'll get into that later on, but uh, Bruce Glasgow, what this does is that you are exploring this haunted mansion that you've all been brought to. Mm -hmm. You are looking around the room, finding omens, finding events, finding items that may help you until eventually something happens, and that's called The Haunt. Yeah. Uh, the Haunt happens, uh, it's going to do one of two things. You're going to go through a tome. Depending on the omen and where it was found, uh, you're going to go to a chart and it's going to tell you the haunt. Sometimes it's going to stay cooperative. Sometimes there's going to be a traitor amongst the mist and they got to take their book and go somewhere else. Well, we all have to read our part of the book. There's two different books. There's the Traitor's Tome and the Survivor's Tome, I think is what it's called. Yeah, Survival's Guide. The Survival's Guide. So the survivors have to find uh, figure out the way they got to win and the traitor has to go find out how they're supposed to win. Uh, it could be interesting. They have to do talk a certain way, or they have to do certain actions. They have to escape because we're trying to expunge them or exercise them or something like that. So it has different aspects of it. I think in the base game, there's like 50 scenarios. Mm -hmm. 
There's uh, 50 scenarios in the base game. And the expansion adds another 25. No, it adds another 50. Is it another 50? Yeah, and actually what makes it really interesting is they got a whole slew of like more, more than 50 designers yeah. to all work on different scenarios. And some big names. It's a massive list of what's happening on that. Yeah. So we're going to break down, if you like the Trail of House on the Hill, which I hope you do since you're watching this during spooky season mm -hmm. on our podcast, we're going to give you recommendations for other games that we think you might also enjoy. Let's start with ease of play. Okay, I got a quick question before we start going. Yeah. How did you want to go about this? I really went into the horror side of things, the the spooky themes of things, more so than like outside of that. You know what I mean? I met. I went with um, a function. Function. Okay. I went with the function of the game, and that's because this game does something very unique. Unique, yeah. And especially. I couldn't come metal. up with a lot of games that do that kind right. of uniqueness, so that's why I went with more of the spooky that right. give you that same kind of feeling. So. Sure. Cool. Yeah. No, I I have a few others that I think are that match the theme where we get the game immersion, of course. Yeah. But yeah, you, it'll make way more sense when we get into it. Um, yeah, the Widow's Walk for for the Honestly, expansion for third edition. The Widow's yeah. Wake uh, expansion. I, uh, some of the ones I've played were very disappointed. I've I played like three or four out of that expansion. Three of them I highly disliked, especially one. Yeah. That to the point where shame. my wife was who was all in love with that game was turned off of that game based on those interactions wow. that I ended up selling it. Wow. Wow, that, that hurts. Yeah. I mean, I saw my expansion, but granted, I have not played it much since yeah. I bought it. And that was years ago. So, ease of play. We're going to talk about if you are familiar with or how familiar Betrayal's rules are. It's pretty simple. You're moving around, modular exploring, board, exploring yeah. there. Um, sometimes then there's the big twist. So, how familiar that is, how easy it is to teach or learn, yeah. and uh, how familiar those rules are to understand. Yeah. You're going to be starting us off. All right. So, the ease of play for me, this is a very simple one. Um, and again, I, like I said, I leaned into more of the spooky aspect of the right. game. Because, you know, Patrol in the House on the Hill was one of the games we usually played during at Halloween. This is one of those uh, haunted house type things. And I, I was trying to think of games that kind of gave that feel, the co-op, where you're working against big bads and stuff like that. The one I went with simply is Horrified. Because um, it's a very simple game, um, you you do some actions, you, you're trying to get the uh, people to certain areas, this way you get rewards, you're fighting against monsters, you're either, you you got your own specific goal for each monster to defeat them, you have to do this or that. Also I went with this because there's three iterations, so if you're not into the Universal Monster movies, you have the Cryptids, mm -hmm. uh, which are some really great minis and are scary, but now you have the uh, Greek Monsters, which is really, really cool aspect of it. Uh, again, it's a simple co-op. It's got that spooky game or mm -hmm. teach or the theme. It's an easy, easy game to teach. And in fact, uh, there's only one new rule in the Greek monster version of it, where you just have to deal with the layers, uh, and and you have your different flavors. Just like in um, Betrayal in the House of the Hill, you Baldur's Gate. We talked about you have an expansion, so technically these are standalone games, but you have all these things. So. Yeah, it is. Uh, for me, this was one of the easier ones for me because I just want to give you that spooky feel. This is this is my Halloween theme list that follows the, along the lines of Patrol in the House on the Hill. Cool. Uh, the one I went with is not a horror game, uh, but I went with the same idea. It's like, you know, a lot of what you're doing is kind of aimlessly wandering until you find the discovery that will mm -hmm. reveal the rest of the story. And then normally you have to kill things with dice. Mm. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, honestly, how it works. Um, but having that story revelation is where the ease comes into it, where it's not so much that the game itself is difficult because it's not, but you don't ever know what mechanisms or what you're going to be doing yeah, um, or what strategies you're going to need until that pivotal moment. So I picked a game that has similar ideas and that's Wonder Book. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonder Book has a number of different chapters. Now granted, this is more of a camp campaign storytelling game. But um, actually, really pretty too. A gorgeous game, um, but yeah, you're you're traveling through. You're trying to figure out, hey, what's up with the Wonder Book? Why does it do this? I um, totally forgot like, about what this are game. these monsters? <laughs> right? Yeah. Why why do these monsters matter? What are you trying to do with them? 
um, like, what's with that pile of bones in the corner there? Why mm -hmm. is there some money that's being, like, like making a weird buzzing noise? Like, and you see, like, these things that you're like, huh, none of this truly makes sense. Yeah. Until I go explore it, then I finally know. Yeah. And Betrayal has that same feeling, um, and it's not a difficult game. In fact, most of the dice that are as, that are used in Wonderbook are 50-50 dice. Yeah. Which is statistically the same as Betrayal. So, there you go. Uh, and to uh, answer Luminous's question, we're just talking about games that are not better than Betrayal on the Hill, House on the Hill. But stuff that we would recommend if you can't find a copy of it or just want to try something because you really, really do enjoy that game. Yeah, or if you like specific aspects of Betrayal, but maybe not others, yeah. we're trying to give you recommendations based on those aspects. So that was ease of play. Yeah, moving uh, into replay value. Wonder Book, value. Horrified. Horrified. Replay value. It's back to me. Mm -hmm. uh, replay value, this was uh, an easy one for me to put on here. Because it does a lot of the things, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of the games. It doesn't give you really the exploration in the sense, but some of the parts of the game can give you the exploration. Uh, so for me, this is a, the only solo game on my list. This is Final Girl. Oh, okay. I knew this was going to be on your Yeah, list. and it's. I figured this is the best spot for for the replay value of it. Okay. So if you have a hard time playing Betrayal in the House on the Hill, because at it min it minimum three players... Yeah. And you can only get one to two players to play sometimes. Uh, me and my wife used to play it where we would just run a four-player game. And whoever became the uh, betrayer, the, that character who becomes the one that betrays, uh, that person takes it over. And then the the th third player basically goes to the other player and they play three players. Gotcha. It, it's not very effective, but it worked it for works. us. It sure. But Final Girl... And the the designer has said he likes to play this two player, so you can play it two player. But I prefer it solo. But you, it's a plug and play style. Uh, but, uh, so you can do this bad guy with this final girl on this location, however you want to do it. I like about that. It has a campaign book, so just like Betrayal Legacy, there's different stories they can do that leads up to this big climactic final uh, situation. Um, it, there's two series out right now that you can find where you can get, uh, up to six different sets in them. So that's basically 12 sets right there. So that there's your expansions as well as there's a third one currently on Kickstarter that will end on Friday the 13th, uh, which has another six sets. So, um, when they become uh, in the stores, they're easy to find. You just need a core game. And you can plug and play whatever which ones you want, and they have legally distinct from. But you got like Halloween. You have uh, the new set is going to have Terminator. Uh, this one ha or the other ones have like the aliens and stuff like that. So if you want that spooky stuff, but you can't get a big enough group, Final Girl is what for you. Well, ABQ plays. If you're sad that you haven't backed season three yet, there's an easy way to fix it. You should back, back it. it. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame you. I haven't backed it either. But I've backed it either of the first I'm two. I'm backed in it. Yep. Yeah. So the one that I picked for replayability, and this is the loosest one, so forgive me, I know it, it won't be as much as hard of a recommendation, but I really like it. I mean, Betrayal of House on the Hill is incredibly replayable. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest selling points. It's like, yeah, it's like a $50, $60 game, yeah. but it is incredible incredibly replayable because yeah, that minimum you, 50 scenarios it's 50 60 dollar game but you still have even yeah. if you play it 25 times you're going to get more than likely 25 different scenarios right and so i figured i wanted to try and find a game that core the core idea of the game is the same no matter what you're always playing the same idea mm -hmm. except every time you delve into it it's a slightly different experience okay and i want to time stories okay i get yeah, that yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. It, that makes sense. It, again, it's kind of loose because Time Stories is technically a one and done, but that's part of the the pleasure of Time Stories is that every time you play it, you learn information. You're supposed to know how you lose. You're supposed to know what wastes your time. You're supposed to know where the red herrings are, and you're supposed to know when you get into those situations where you're like, okay, that's almost definitely what we need to do. Mm -hmm. How do we get into it? And again, Dice Combat, yep. similar idea, um, immersive storyline, and now Time Stories doesn't really have anything like the, the one player playing against other players. You're always playing together, yeah. but still, it has that effectiveness of 
if you're looking for a deep story mm -hmm. and every time you play it something is interestingly new about it yeah time stories is, would be my suggestion for that okay it's pretty loose it's not quite as replayable as that but i did play time stories for nearly seven years yeah so i guess it's not give or that. take missing a year or two <laughs> yeah I'll, abq plays i highly recommend time stories is one of my favorite experiences playing games by far yeah, okay. Moving right. on to Meaningful Choice. Meaningful Choice. Here we go. Off to you again. All right, Meaningful Choice. Uh, I don't really have any loosey-goosey ones except for maybe my last one, but we'll get into that when that happens. But this one does a lot of the somewhat of what Betrayal does. You got your modular board. You have possibly multiple enemies depending on the type of haunt. Uh, you have a big bad or uh, not a traitor per se, but there are some big bads here. There's a lot of discussion how we need to do certain things. Uh, this one is Cthulhu Death May Die. Uh, and they, and I haven't they, played this yet. Yeah, there's a bunch of story aspects of it, too. It's uh, Rob Davio and Eric Ling's take on H.P. Lovecraft uh, sis, uh, system. Uh, very elaborate, very well produced. Uh, I, the modular board, at times, can be overrun with so much stuff on there that they don't really actually fit on the board. For everything in there and if you paid the extra two hundred dollars for the ten foot cthulhu or the two foot cthulhu right that just, just takes up your entire table space it is a phenomenal game i do enjoy it a lot uh, i love the fact that they took a, a an ip and made it their own and uh there because none of these stories follow any of the hp lovecraft the stories they just have their own character or use the characters from it so it's really well done, and it does a lot like Patrol in the House on the Hill. It's co-op. It's fully co-op, not semi-co-op. But the combat is dice rolling. Your checks, there's stuff that you got to do. You're investigating. you got to pick up items. You need certain items to do certain things. Yeah, it's it's really good. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, Death May Die. ABQ plays Luminous, and we'll say... Yeah, they have a friend who loves it, and Luminous does enjoy it as well. It's such a good game. So, the one I picked for Meaningful Choice is one that, um, again, same core idea. You're going to be using the items that you gain to get your characters better. Mm -hmm. You're going to boost your dice rolls. You're going to fight the things that you need to do. And you won't know the objective until you, until you discover it. Then you'll find out truly what it is that you have to beat. This game has a lot of different expansions for it as well. And has a lot of different variability in it. And I played this for a number of years as well, and probably played at least 30 times. This is Pathfinder the Adventure card game. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% think that if you like Betrayal House on the Hill, there is a pretty decent chance that you would like something like Pathfinder the Adventure card game as mm -hmm. well. Because there's a bunch of different boxes. The base set alone has a number of scenarios yeah, that yeah. are really fun. And you never really truly know what you're going to be doing to succeed until you find the bad guy uh -huh. and how they and how you have to play against them. Yeah, ABQ plays likes it too. I played this for so many years. I don't have it anymore just because it did get saved me after like the fourth box of expansion. But it wasn't expensive. It wasn't yeah. hard to keep playing. I definitely enjoyed the best of it and getting RPG style dice yeah. and boosting those and getting skills. That you can use again and again and again yeah. for future ones. That is very reminiscent of something that Betrayal does. Yeah, and uh, my wife and I myself really enjoyed this one too. But like you said, after like the first uh, box when we went through all the scenarios, we bought into another set of scenarios. And I'm like, we were both just like, this is kind of exactly what we did. We already yeah. got our feel about it. Right. It doesn't so, bring out the story yeah. enough. And then uh, I think when we played it. Right afterwards, I started getting, uh, we've just got Gloomhaven. And so that pretty much killed it for us. Yeah. Yep, I can hear that. Cool. All right, let's go into... Game Immersion. Game Immersion. This will be the fun one. Did uh, you want to come back to this one, actually? Sure, we can come back to let's this one. Let's go to Art and Production. Yeah. Because I think Game Immersion is definitely worth it. Here we go. This also, is you. So this one is our first crossover. Um, art and Production, I found that... You know, there's a lot of, there's some miniatures in Betrayal House on the Hill. There's some nice custom dice that you need specifically for this. It is, there's... It's um, horrified. Yeah, it's horrified. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. The, the, a lot of the components I mean, you similar. like Final the Girl. The art but... is very similar. Yeah, no, I thought about Final Girl, but 
Um, a lot of the components aren't just quite the same yeah. as Betrayal. Um, really horrified is where it's at. There's some minis for the bad guys. There's some minis for the stuff. Um, same idea you're going to be doing around. This is better components because the tokens in Betrayal are pretty chintzy. Mm -hmm. And definitely the tokens are amazing and horrified. Yeah. But still, it's it's that is if you like the art and production, if you like the theming in it, and you like the effort that they put into making that theme come out, mm -hmm. you're going to get that same theme with Horrified, albeit a little more cartoonish. Yeah. Uh, solid mechanisms, too. Yes. Uh, so for me, my art production one, this is one where I said it was kind of loosey-goosey. Uh, when I always do the art production of this one, it's got to be either the same or higher. Yeah. And so for me, this is a much higher game. I picked this one specifically because this is a game that you can get currently but um, i also put the fact that the re theme is on here as well my pick is specter ops because you're going to get the same kind of tension you have that the, the one versus many aspect that you'll get from um betrayal in the house in the hills art and production yeah okay yeah it's in my art production because it's really well produced by Plat Hat. Uh, we sure. just saw recently the Trick or Treat Studio version of it. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's going to become Halloween yeah. uh, by Trick or Treat Studios. One versus many. So you have that, that traitor aspect right then and there from the very beginning of the game. Yeah. Um, you, you're the hunters trying to find the spy. And so yeah. your whole aspect is like wor working the board, trying to find the spy. The spy is sitting... Mining his own uh, thing, he's trying to hit a certain amount of objectives to win. So he's like saying he's got to blow up the the factory. So he has to hit three points and set bombs and escape before it goes off. The hunters have different abilities to go after the the spy. Uh, there's little really good nice minis in there. The board's really nice. The the spy has their own little thing that they're tracing out and they're letting you know. It's really, really well done. I like it, and I'm really excited because it's going to be inversed in Halloween. One person is going to be uh, Michael Myers, which, again, it's going to be coming out soon. Um, and one person is going to be Michael Myers, and the only time that people can see it is if they get a direct eye of line of sight, just straight on on Michael Myers. He's, all, he's standing in front of him, and that's the only time you're going to see him. So you're really going to get that tension when that game comes out, where everybody's trying to get what they need, find the children, and escape. Whereas in this one, um, Spectre Ops, the, the spy needs to get his objectives done in Escape before he gets captured by the bad guy. So you're getting all of that tension that you would in the Betrayal, the back end of the game of Betrayal uh, at the House on the Hill. There's another one you haven't played, huh? No, I've not played it. it it's, it's. I was it's, just thinking, you talked a lot about it. It sounds fun. I don't know, understand about the art and production part of it, though. Yeah, I had to just squeeze this, it in this here. This is more like immersion or whatever. Yeah. No, no, no. You had to, I had to squeeze it in somewhere. And it's more along the lines because of the minis, uh, the sure. card components, slightly better. Uh, some of the stuff that going in there. And I don't think there's dice in there. I can't really remember. It's been a couple years. But it, it it's slightly better than what Patrol on the House on the Hill gives. Okay. All right. And Luminous says, Unsettled Survival Horror. Okay. I have to check that one out. But my game immersion one, this was the first one that went on my list. This is where it goes. There, no, there's no other place for yeah, this one. This was the. This <laughs> was well. It wasn't the first one I thought of, but this was definitely one of the first. Game immersion. Here we go. I'll start us off. Um, so, what the reason why I, I wanted to wait for this one? Because I really wanted to explain my reasoning for this one. Because I 100% think that this is one of the best examples. When I think Betrayal House on the Hill, I think every campy horror from the 90s and the 80s and everything combined into one, into being just Did you always, go nightmare? Always a ridiculous <laughs> concept. Don't you interrupt me, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did I just call it? <laughs> maybe. So, you know, it's, it, it's so campy, it's so cheesy, and that's the point. Once you said campy, I knew where you were going. Yes, and nightmare is, uh, or atmosphere, either atmosphere, one. yeah. Um, is another board game that really brings out just why oh, yeah. I like Halloween. I was I I was figuring you were gonna put this on your list. I was just trying to figure out where you were gonna put this yeah. on your list. Yeah, it's immersion. It's got to be because like when in Betrayal, there's that critical moment where the haunt happens, 
and the storyline is suddenly revealed. There's one player who goes off to the side. They're reading the Trader's Tome. Everyone else is trying to figure out what they are doing against them. And you feel like, it's like, man, we're doing like a horror movie strategy right now. It's like, this guy is going to start like exploding like bugs out of his skin. And they're going to start flying at us. And we got to try and fend these things off while trying to defeat this beast of like a thing that this guy became. And... And that just silly, campy horror style on it really brings in, like, the essence of what Halloween is about in my world and in my family. Like, how it's just the cheesiest, like, over-the-top, kind of silly, but really fun horror movie. Nightmare pulls that off well. You're being shouted at by this ridiculous actor who's calling you a maggot, who's belittling your gameplay... Who, like, and I still feel bad for one of our friends who, she got the first time she ever played it was, like, last year we did a horror, uh, a Halloween night on our game night, and she didn't know what to expect, so when we all gathered in the living room around the TV, full volume, and she started being called a maggot, like, unjustly so, and she was like, what, what's going on? <laughs> and they're like, say my gatekeeper, and then it'll make, it's like, it'll make him not mad, like, just... Say yes, my gatekeeper. Otherwise, you, you know, it's it's so campy. It's so great. It really embodies Halloween for me. And that's this was the only one that surpasses Betrayal House on the Hill for just that experience. Okay, All right. that's my justification. All right. So my game immersion pick here is the one that gives me a lot of. Uh, the only thing it doesn't give me is like the modular uh, board exploration sure. aspect of it. You still have an exploration. Because in this one, you're searching for certain things. Because you need to feed your people, you need to survive, there's things coming after you if you make too much noise. Um, this is a lot of dice rolling, too. That's uh, on the run? No, nope. I'm just kidding. Uh, it can be semi co op or it can be fully co op. You do get into the role playing aspect of it because you're having different uh, crew members helping you out or uh, survivors helping you out. This one can possibly have a hidden betrayer in it. And this is Dead of Winter. Yep. Yep. <laughs> this is one of our go to, where it was at one point, one of our go to Halloween games. This gives you a lot of some of that tension that you get in House, uh, House uh, Betrayal in the House on the Hill. It's such a tongue twister. Uh, because of the fact that at the start of the game, there could possibly be a betrayer, a traitor amongst the group. And you're noticing people uh, hoarding cards, and you don't know why, but they could be a betrayer, or they may have, because you can't win the game. You gotta win. If you're not the traitor, you have to win the game as a group, but you also have to meet your certain goal. Um, and then okay. you have uh, certain aspects of this game, like the crossroad cards, where something bad could happen, maybe something good happen. There's a lot of dice check in here, especially that one bad die where it either gives you a wound or gives you a frostbite or you get infected and you got to roll or you got to kill that character because if you don't, then it's passing no. to the next lowest character. It gives you a lot of that tension that you get into it you get into that role playing you're like oh my god just kill that character this way the next guy doesn't get it we're screwed because we need that person because they're really good at searching over here for certain things um i really do enjoy this game a lot dead of winter does give you a lot of betrayal in fact one of the reasons we got rid of it was the expansion the other reason is because this one gave us a lot of that stuff that helped betrayal in the house in the hill but a lot more tension where if more people were invested in it yeah. So for me, Dead of Winter game immersion. Okay, I I can't knock you on that one. As much as you disliked my mine. I don't dislike yours. I was just trying to figure out where you would finagle it. Did you ever play Nightmare with us? Uh, not with you guys, but I played it long time ago. I think I was a teenager last time I played it. Okay. Because it was the old VHS version. Yeah, I'd be really curious to see what like if we replayed it again, like as an as adults. Mm. Like, how much you would either like it less or more. But I don't know. And ABQ Play says, the one time we we played this, we won, but everyone individually lost. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things about it. And, and even, like, the possible traitor is, like, really yeah questionable for some people. But yeah. either way. So, again, point of this episode is quite simple. If you like Betrayal House on the Hill for any of those five reasons... 
hopefully we've given you 10 different suggestions on different things that you can go and play and hopefully enjoy. Yes. Yeah. And that's our reasoning why we like why we especially think for good. spooky season. Uh, if that's the only game you play at Halloween, here's some more. That's right. So we want to thank you for tuning in. If you ever want to join us, like our friends, Illuminus, APQ plays, uh, Mario fanatics, any of you guys who want to join us on a live episode and provide your input during that episode, join us at twitchtv games and please follow us there so that way you can be notified when we go live. As well as all video reuploads can be found on YouTube under youtube.com slash at everyday board games podcast and if you like what we do there are three things you can do to help us grow on the platform subscribe if you're not like the video and comment down below and tell us your thoughts on the subject as well as all audio versions can be found on most podcast platforms under everyday board games podcast this includes spotify google amazon music podbean and now apple and if you ever want to contact us directly whether that's to say hi enter in a future contest or give us ideas for future episodes Email us at everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com. With that being said, as always, I've been your host, Daniel. And I've been your host, Daniel. And we want to thank you for listening to Everyday Board Games. And remember, every day is a good day for board gaming.